Actually, I did notice something that's missing. Um, this policy, if, if that's what you're going to create as a policy or if it's just going to be embedded in the waiver under ISB, ISP planning, this doesn't talk about the CIS verification committee or the, um, the verification score. Yeah. And you, you do bring up a good point because when we had the December 5th meeting, some of the things that questions that did come up was about the verification. Yeah. Yes. Um, you're right, we did not talk about it this in this policy, but again, that's the feedback that we want to see if it would be added to or we can capture that somewhere else. Because right now, some families, some MCOs aren't going through that process at all with the family. They verify the CIS score, but then don't inform. When it talks about after it's administered and the care coordinator talks to us? We yeah. Thank you. So one of the questions that came up in the UN work group this week um, when we were doing a sort of a mock of resource allocation to go to stakeholder groups uh, with, um, we had a, a question, I think it was from Jesse Smokey, uh, he was pretending to be a stakeholder. He said, you know, how does my CIS score impact my cost band? Okay, so I realize this is about ISP planning, but you know, so if the stuff I'm, happened to be in the CIS and now it's in my plan, is people, people could, so if it's not in this, where is it? That you will say that yes. it's all part of the formula around the clinical description, right. just one piece that, the CIS and SQs are just one piece of that clinical. We'll have to talk about the algorithm in the waiver once we get that far for how that kind of thing is about. So that would probably not be here. That would be a more general. Um, but what you might say here, I might recommend you consider saying here would be the score does not stand alone in any way to dictate the volume, amount, array, et cetera. It doesn't stand alone. Because I think a lot of people are concerned that it somehow does stand alone. It's sort of like a grade in school. If I get a C, that means I, 
or F, I mean, that means I get services that suck. Or, you know what I'm saying? So I want to score great, but I don't know if it's 100 I should make or if it's a 50. You know, which one should I get to get more? You know, you can't really game the sis. I mean, I think you just need to be clear that the score doesn't stand alone in any way to help or hurt you. Right. And, and you bring up a good point, and that kind of goes with the point you made here about the sis does not drive it in ISP. You don't just take it and plop it in. Right. So. But can I wrap back up from that for a second, too? What Renee's getting ready to do is start doing some fact sheets and some FAQ types of things, because we want to, we finally have permission, I think, right, Dave, to get a website going to help with communication, and so those sheets also would filter down the MCAs and all of that, too. So that might be another really good place that might actually be a good one to even start with since so many people have had assist at this point just to, and so and we're going to be looking at trying to get that into, you know, uh, uh, friendly language and all the rest of it. So we're coming out of the system with SNAP that yeah. did. Yeah. The score did have a major impact on what you get done. Yeah. <laughs> right or wrong. So that might, yeah, that might be one of the Exactly. The funding bands that are developed based on the CIS scores. And um, Andrea and, anyway, there was one presentation on it that day, and I remember asking them about at that presentation if the person was at the top of their funding band and has intensive needs, what flexibility is there to meet this intensive need. And that's, you know, when you draw a line in the sand that says, here's how much money you're going to get. No matter what, you can't. You've got to have some exception processes that work for people, but also work for the system who has to determine uh, a fair and reasonable ability to appeal, etc. We have spoken with the AGs, and they have weighed in on this piece and what you know they'd be willing to defend. Even. But so what? The budget will not be appealable, but the services will be. So in other words, if you want more services above your budget, that's appealable. If you want. It. You know, and again, you can always make a request. Absolutely, you can always make a request. So, but the way we're going to structure this, so that's going to be the structure of the appeal, the appeal process. So, of course, if you get kicked into a higher band of services, you're going to be kicked into a higher band of allocation. But otherwise, you're appealing twice. So, but the same not, thing is not appealable, but the uh, it's services grievable. are. It is grievable, which requires so, a response. So we're talking there is a, a dollar cap on this that anywhere in between here we may appeal the services that we have been authorized to. But once we get to this cap, we're not going no, no, to. No, the no. The, so the theory of the theory of what hopefully we have mm. is, 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 mm. is, I mean, I guess they're appealable to, but I, I think what we're doing in that culture shift is actually, John, you have $50,000 and here's your cafeteria menu. You don't have to appeal nothing. Do what you want to do. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, yes, there needs to be a plan. I mean, you need to, and again, we're back to health and safety. So then and, back to Bob's question, if we get that 50000 mm -hmm. Because and, it shouldn't be based on necessarily the budget. It's not that you hit the 50000 It's that somehow you have some additional service needs, and you make that service need request, and it's considered and approved or denied and so on, and you do get appeal rights based on that. So if you have a need, <laughs> even if you had a cap of 50 because right. there's a need, correct. that will be you a band. Correct. And then, you, right. and then that would automatically okay. lead you to another band. So it's not the dollar amount, per se. It's, right. the set of, it's, it's the your band. service needs. But that just needs to be clearly communicated I think, then. That, oh, yeah. That, the process would be a huge piece of this. Absolutely. I think one of the things that, that 
what we also heard across the board, all of us in the sessions, and I think, and I won't, I think I am paraphrasing Ted, but he says, is that there seemed to be reasonably good support for the idea of an individual budget with flexible service <laughs> definitions, with a, um, an ability to, for a fair and equitable process to appeal or brief, whatever the words you want to use on that, but for reconsideration. Mm -hmm. And understanding, I think... Well, we, it's a big difference in terms of scope. No, no, they're terms are different, but I'm saying in, in, in general terms about that, that if, if what, what, what it happens in the process is not something that you believe is fair and you think there's a, that needs to be something else, there is a way um, to, to appeal that, read that, however you Depending on the... Depending on the nature of what you're doing. The point being, though, is that we know, and I think this is a, you know, we have to continue to say over and over again, there will be cases where people will not be happy with what that number is. And there will be cases where we will defend vigorously the process to get there. And and hopefully we can we can come to some in the ground, but we, what we're, remember, we're trying to achieve a lot of different objectives here. And one objective is that once, once we've decided on what that budget is, people should know that's what it is. They should feel no, no pressure or belief that that's going to change on them. They should feel comfortable that they're, they can build without, up. Without a request from them. I right. Mean, right. What, I'm, what I'm saying, they can feel comfortable, you can build the life around that, that okay. process. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to be worried about us jerking you around uh, doing it. But effort. in theory, here's your base budget right. services, here's your base budget. Yeah. Here. Yeah, and it, and, it, and it allows us, the other piece to remember is that what it also allows us to do is to create real predictability long term for what the innovations waiver will cost the state, which I believe also then allows for the General Assembly over time to make decisions logically about how many slots there were in the fund. Because I think it's, a lot, it's, a, it's much more difficult to make that decision if you don't know and you don't feel it's predictable long term. Yep. So one of the challenges is going to be, um, probably, where you've got an adult with IDD who's got a lifelong support needs, and uh, I'm a big believer of habilitation happening that teaches <coughs> adaptive skills and teach people to be more independent, at both at home and home living skills, and it's broader. In the bath everywhere. That's right learn how to prepare meals, etc., live more independently, and hopefully can live in a, <coughs> least, really in the least restrictive setting that's, uh, that, that the person can live. Um, but also, um, meaningful day, day support, supported employment or supported work. What's going to probably happen is there's going to be people that get that now who are not going to get that under the fund. And I hope I'm wrong with yeah, with the funding base. You are to the extent that, again, it's not, again, the decision is not, the decision's yours, Bob. Bob, you've got $50,000. You want to spend the whole amount of day support? Go nuts, Bob. I mean, that was your decision. Right. But if you're getting more, so, so if it's based on current, uh, what, what the per person is currently getting as a starting point. Okay. So the algorithm that I was talking about, mm -hmm. you've decided, to it, I guess the algorithm is a, is a, doesn't have, maybe has no meaning. When we get down to, when we have this HSRI discussion, one of, that's one of the things that I'm hoping, no, I'm not even hoping that I know that we'll be discussing as part of that process. Because yes. back to Monica's, or Cindy's point to Monica, the is not it. They're also going to look at your historical <laughs> spending and what you were getting. That's going to be a part of that algorithm. Um, so I, I, let's, can we take that and come back to it? Because there there is an agenda, there is a specific date where that will be part of the discussion. I right. hear what you're saying, and yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to better understand that. Yes, and we have a date. We, because I'm bringing in consultants, there's a date for that. So specific to the CIS, um, some comments that I've made in an earlier document. Um, no. If I understand, the CIS will be the primary tool that we'll be using for determining and di discontinuing the SNAP, right? Yes, yeah, so we'll write the SNAP out whenever we have it. That's right. And with the SIS, um, right now, 
the SIS evaluators are, it's done by AAI, IDD, is that right? No, the AAI, IDD trained SIS evaluators at the MCOs. At the MCOs. And then they train other SIS evaluators? No. Um, I don't think so. That hasn't happened yet, but we want to train CRI employees. So, so, um, but the point, point is this, this is a very important task and uh, in the provider world we often talk about assuring that people are trained and are, there is competency, interrate reliability, and uh, we've talked about this in the past and I'd like to know if that's still on the table that forces evaluators, they will be certified and there will be interrater reliability to assure the... the yes, uh, they have an ongoing contract. So right. and I think to me, where you were coming you. from, part of the sample was done by AIDB, mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Um, and so you're saying the policy maybe needs to reflect that. But yes, in my ongoing... I will, yeah. I, I, I've been talking to budget about this already, that we will, because they're looking at every single contract with, like, with, right. the, with, the, two, with the fine tooth comb. But we will always have an IRR component, Good. and they will always have to have, and we, we will we will be working on some internal North Carolina trainer trainer capacity. But within that, it'll have to be under that AIDD umbrella, and maybe that does need to be reflected in policy. Absolutely, it is in our contract. Yeah, and I guess it says that the AIDD trains this interviewer because even with the train the trainer, the AIDD staff are going to be there monitoring that training. So it's still coming through AAIDD. They won't be certified unless that AAIDD trainer feels like they've met that criteria. So, so I guess we can expand on that oh, because here it, it, it makes it seem like, you know, the person actually came from AAIDD and trained the person. So they're coming to monitor the train the trainer. Mm -hmm. So they're still certified in that way. And I'm just asking, I guess a question is, that is that the most those can cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And is that the most affordable way to do this while still assuring the competency of the CIS evaluator? That's just a question. Well, whether it has to be AAIDD. Um, that's in the legislation. Yeah, is there tool. That's in the legislation. And is there full right proprietary? Mm hmm. But it has to be a CIS. Excuse me. So if you're going to be the CIS, it has to be AIDD. So Rose really knows. Well, I don't know that Rose really knows, but I would, I would say, I think to ensure the fidelity to the CIS, you would want to ensure at some level that AAIDD is involved. I don't know that, you know. But I have to pay them just to use this. I have to pay yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Have a Every piece of paper. Yeah. Okay. So I think over time you would want to limit the involvement in AID beyond the fact that we're paying for the use of the tool. Once you pay a more training. But they won't let you have the tool without the R. I mean, I'm just saying, I mean, they're, you ain't going to take that tool and go off on your own nuts. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> they're not going to let you. I got you. Thank you. I mean, even outside of, I mean, yeah, but they require the IRR segment to get the license. But a very good point, sir. So do you think there needs to be language beyond what Monica has, or does this group have, to that point? Because what she does have down there in the second par in the last paragraph is that you're administered by the AAIDD trained CIS interviewer. I mean, it's, do you feel like more language needs to be put into that factor? Well, Back when I read this and had it come in, I, I wrote, training for CIS evaluators should be standardized, evaluators must pass competency testing, and done at a local level, the most cost-effective way for assuring quality standards, insurance, and interrated reliability. So if you're going to do the CIS and you're going to have that on there, I think those requirements need to be on this piece of paper. Those assurances. Okay. Any, any thoughts or mm -hmm. comments to that point? I think it's a good idea. Parents and people like me no. And if we go online and find this policy and it doesn't have it in there, then we're going to think, wow, huh. we can do anything that we want. Okay. So if you would get those comments emailed, Bob, I don't want to finish your wording on that. 
submission so that you kind of walk them through what you're doing and you don't have any surprises. Is that part of your process, you think? Not for this. And go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I, I think CMS right now, um, it might be hard for them within what they're doing because right now they're dealing with all the HCBS stuff and waiver changes that are coming in, so it might be a little bit much on their plate to try. And also, it's already in this waiver, the current waiver. I mean, not to this, not all of these changes, but resource allocation and cardinal. And I mean, so it's, it's, it's more of an expansion than a new. Oh, I see what I you're saying. I was just trying to understand yeah, that. Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, and I kind of skipped over this question. When are we posting this for public comment? Uh, that's a good question. We'll get back to you. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm trying to do back, back dates in my head. March 1st for public comment. Yeah. Mm. March 1st. So only 30 days? It's not typically 45 days? No, that's complicated policy. That's her policy. Okay. So this one can only be done. Thank you. 
And because I, I printed off a lot of things and left them right on the computer when I was walking out the door. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, so um, I know that just like with this one, we're getting the feedback back in a definition so that we can look at it and talk about it. And I know the way that you sent out some dates we were talking and scheduling. So we will be seeing all that feedback first here and then um, before it's put out there for that public comment. Is that correct? I'm yeah. sorry, I was going to say, but apparently, yes. <laughs> oh, look at Renee, too. Thank you. So the scope it's of all on your name. <laughs> the scope of the materials for public comment will be bigger, so. so it'll have all these definitions in it. I mean, you can't see it. As well as some of the more, the larger policy decisions that I'm right, I wrote down. We need to bring that to probably next. Our next agenda of things like relative is you know, just to have that conversation. Um, we'll go through some of the different segments of the waiver that will be changed besides the work groups that we're going to have to talk about this policy. So it's a general, general policy. I think maybe will be the next topic for us. So we can talk about some of these issues as well as anything Kenneth may have to bring back, assuming he ever comes back again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it's not> again. <laughs> Anything else when we go to the order? You get now 20 to 40 minutes early. Okay. Adjourn. Adjourn.